Hello everyone. My name is Michael Child and I work for the Neo Carbon Energy Project with the Solar Economy Group at La Peranta University of Technology. The main aim of my work is to examine the transition of the Finnish energy system towards long-term sustainability. Today, I will talk about the role of 100% renewable energy systems in achieving carbon neutrality as a way of mitigating the effects of climate change. This is the first of two videos that will examine the components of current and future energy systems. In task one, you were introduced to some of the important aspects of the current energy systems, including the resources, conversion technologies, also including storage, and energy demands. You were also introduced to the main sectors of the energy system, which included electricity, heat, and mobility. Our main challenge today is to redesign the energy system uh, that was presented based on fossil fuels into one which results in essentially zero carbon emissions, not by any means a simple task. Fossil fuels have long been the foundation of global energy systems. These storable fuels have provided almost all the flexibility needed to meet our variable demands for energy services. Therefore, removing fossil fuels will then mean unlocking a great deal of flexibility in other aspects of the energy system. Again, no simple task. However, the rewards for doing so include being able to reduce carbon emissions, mitigate climate change, improve trade balances, and increase energy equality among the nations of the world. So how do we accomplish this? The first candidate for a replacement for fossil fuels that many of you may have mentioned in response to question 1.1 is biomass. Indeed, biomass can easily function as a direct replacement for fossil fuels. Biomass can be converted to liquid fuels that replace oil, solid fuels that replace coal or peat, and gaseous fuels that replace natural gas. In many of these cases, conversion technologies can remain the same. In other cases, new conversion technologies will be needed. However, there are two main problems associated with the extensive use of biomass. First, biomass has different storage characteristics than fossil fuels. In particular, biomass cannot be stored for long periods of time without rotting or deteriorating in quality. This decreases the flexibility of the energy system. Second, there is simply not enough biomass in the world that can be used sustainably to cover our energy demands. Other options must therefore be employed to reduce pressure on biomass resources. The first option is that we can reduce our overall demands for energy and become more efficient in these demands. We could decide, for example, to walk or ride a bike instead of driving a car. Moreover, we can make our houses or appliances more energy efficient. This could result in less need for biomass. At the same time, global populations are growing and becoming more affluent. This could mean greater demands for energy over the long term. As shown, traditional energy sectors exist in isolation. However, integrating the demands of conversion technologies can offer a significant means of decreasing overall fuel use and cost by increasing efficiency. One way of doing this is by connecting our production and demands for heat with those for electricity. In the Nordic countries especially, this is done by utilizing combined heat and power. Condensing power plants create electricity from fuels without utilizing most of the resulting heat from combustion. Currently, condensing plants only use about 30 to 38% of the energy contained in the fuels. The rest just makes clouds. However, CHP plants utilize up to 90% of the energy from fuels. Approximately 40% of this will be converted into electricity, while about 50% is converted into usable heat. This heat can be transferred to a district heating grid where it can be used to replace heat commonly generated by individual heaters in homes and other buildings. A common feature of the district heating system is thermal storage. This can provide significant volumes of storage in caves, underground pits, and insulated tanks. Thermal storage tends to be relatively cheap, 
and adds a great deal of flexibility to the energy system, providing potentially long-term storage that can be used even on a seasonal scale. This means that heat generated in summer months could potentially be stored until it's needed during the colder winter months. Another important feature of district heating systems is their ability to harness heat energy from a wide variety of resources. Solar collectors can generate hot water that can be injected into the district heating system. Additionally, waste heat can be recovered from a variety of industrial processes. This combination of efficiency, storage, and new resources aids in relieving the pressure on biomass resources. Next, we can look at adding even more additional resources. Question 1.1 asked you to compile a list of energy resources. Let's compare your list to the list that I came up with. And I'll draw your attention to the following figure. As you can see, the potential to use biomass as a resource is less than half of the current energy demand and is expected to be only about 20% of demand in 2050 at best. Other forms of energy include solar, wind, ocean energy, this includes energy from waves, currents, and salinity gradients, hydropower, geothermal power, and tidal power. These resources obviously have the potential to more than meet our needs for the future. In examining the potential of the fossil and nuclear resources in the figure, Keep in mind that they are finite resources, while the others represent values that can be harnessed each year. From these renewable resources, both electricity and heat can be generated. However, the main issue with many of these resources is that they are in intermittent by nature. We never know when the sun will shine and the wind will blow. Therefore, we require further flexibility from other aspects of the energy system. Conversely, some of these resources offer fixed, regular supply, for example, geothermal energy and hydro dams, while others are highly predictable, run of river hydro dams, tides, and to some extent, ocean energy. The result of the variability of production associated with many of these resources is that there will be times when supply of energy will not be in balance with demands. One way of dealing with this imbalance is to import and export electricity at appropriate times. Alternatively, as already mentioned, some of our demands could follow supply as our own behavior could represent a significant flexibility for the energy system. At other times, different types of storage and conversion technologies can be used to bridge the gap between supply and demand. It has already been mentioned that thermal storage can offer flexibility up to a seasonal timescale. We have also seen how combined heat and power and district heating can integrate the electricity and heat sectors. Further integration can come from heat pumps, which is the next element that we'll add to our energy system. There are several types of heat pumps, but the basic principle is the same. Electricity is used to facilitate the efficient use of some form of heat that is freely available in the environment, from the air, from the ground, or from water. What this means is that three to five units of heat can be created for each unit of electricity used. So, when electricity is available at times when supply exceeds demand, heat can be created that can either be used or stored. Such heat pumps can be used on a large scale as part of the district heating network, or on a smaller scale in individual homes. The main benefits of the widespread use of heat pumps is that fewer resources are needed due to highly efficient energy production and costs can be saved due to a lower need for individual heating systems, such as boilers and furnaces in individual homes and in larger buildings. There is also a direct connection between the electricity production and a major form of storage, the thermal storage of the district heating system. So far, we have addressed the issue of supply exceeding demand to some extent. However, two important issues remain. 
More flexibility in the energy system must be found not only to balance any possible remaining oversupply, but must also adequately account for times when supply is less than demand. Our flexible demands are limited to some extent, so further options are needed. This will be the topic of our next video.